Good morning, everybody. Uh, near and far. So um, it's a real privilege this morning to introduce uh, Julie Johnson, who's a Farm D and Dean of the University of Florida College of Pharmacy. So um, this is going to be a particularly relevant talk because we are um, involved now in a number of studies that um, are going to involve um, pharmacogenomics. So we're really excited um, to have this talk this morning. So um, Julie Johnson received her PharmD from the University of Texas at Austin. And the uh, university, I don't know, what is UT? Is that university? I guess University of Texas Health Science Center. Um, she completed a postdoc fellowship in cardiovascular pharmacology and pharmacokinetics at Ohio State. Her research focuses on cardiovascular drug pharmacogenomics and disease gene associations that are relevant to pharmacogenomics and the influence of race and ethnicity on drug response and pharmacogenomics. The majority of her research centers around efforts in hypertension, heart failure, with a primary focus on proteins that are drug targets and the impact of their genetic polymorphisms on drug response and disease. And I really wish I knew what all of that meant. I guess we're going to find out. Her research has been continuously funded by NIH or the American Heart Association since 1990, and she recently became a member of the NIH Pharmacogenetics Research Network with a project focused on pharmacogenomics of antihypertensive drugs. She's an internationally recognized leader in pharmacogenomics and genomic medicine with over 290 peer-reviewed publications and nearly $50 million in research funding as a principal investigator. Um, we've all had the privilege now of working with Dr. Johnson as part of the NIH Implementing Genomics in Practice, or IGNITE network, which you've, some of you have heard about. Um, this is a consortium that the Institute participates in to ensure that our patients are able to take part in cutting edge research. We're going to hear more today about pharmacogenetics, I think, in general, and hopefully a little bit about the um, the studies that we're beginning here uh, at Mount Sinai and at the Institute. So it's a great privilege to have Julie Johnson here, and we welcome you. So thank you. It's, um, it's an honor to be here, and welcome to everybody who's not in the room here with us. Um, we do distance, distance uh, broadcasting all the time, so this is familiar to me. So what I want to talk to you about um, is some of the work that we're doing in pharmacogenetics, provide a little bit of overview just about the concept. So um, for some of you, the early part of the presentation um, will be a little bit of overview. I think there's CE for this, so there's my um, conflicts. Um, and so what I want to do is talk about um, really sort of the concepts underlying pharmacogenetics, some of the evidence base and guidelines that help to drive um, some of the things that we're doing in pharmacogenetics. I'll talk to you a little bit about some work we have done at the University of Florida to document the impact of pharmacogenetics in improving clinical outcomes. Um, talk a little bit about our experience. We've been implementing um, pharmacogenetics at UF since 2012, and I'll tell you the different scenarios and some of the things that we have learned there. Uh, and then finally, um, we'll talk about the IGNITE2 uh, pharmacogenetics trial, which is called ADOPT, and give you um, sort of a high-level overview of that trial. So this is really about precision medicine, which I think people have heard a lot about. I mean, there's a lot of elements to precision medicine. One of those is genetics and one of those is pharmaco pharmacogenetics. But a lot of people would argue that, you know, one of the things that really is most actionable within this precision medicine realm right now is pharmacogenetics. And whether that's for um, non-cancer drugs, uh, so germline variation, um, and certainly in cancer therapy, nearly all of the new drugs um, that have been approved in the last five, five or so years by the FDA for cancer are targeted um, based on genetic variation in the tumor. So, um, so this is really sort of the concept of pharmacogenetics. And so for most chronic diseases that you deal with in family medicine, um, we tend to sort of have one of two approaches. We have people with the same diagnosis and everybody gets the same drug, or people have... Um, uh, there's lots of choices and there's a bit of a trial and error approach. And so the reality is for any drug, particularly for chronic diseases, um, there are really three categories of people. There are those who are going to have a good response, 
those who are going to have um, a poor or no response, and those who have adverse effects or toxicities. So if we break those down, um, we figure that out right now by giving them the drug and seeing what happens, which means that we probably minimally lose um, two or three months in, in getting them to optimize therapy. And if you look at hypertension, which as Neil said, is where I've done a lot of my work, although I'll talk nothing about hypertension, you know, despite um, five to six first-line drug classes, 30, 40, First-line antihypertensive drugs control of hypertension in this country and across the world is only about 50% among treated hypertensives. So we're clearly not that great at um, optimizing therapy when you have to take an empirical approach. And so, um, so the idea is, that, is if we could do this before we give them the drug, and you can guide therapy in that way. So if they're predicted to have a good response for the drug that you're thinking about, you do that. If they're predicted to have a poor response, you do something else, use a different drug. And if they're predicted to have toxicity, in general, there are two reasons that patients have toxicity. Um, one is because they have an excessively high drug concentration. That's a pharmacokinetic driven toxicity. You can typically control that by just lowering the dose. So they might not require a normal dose, the average dose, but they may be fine on a lower dose. If it's not a concentration, a drug concentration related um, toxicity, then you need to use a different drug. So the idea is to move from figuring this out by trial and error to using genetic and other clinical factors to put people in these groups and select the right drug from the outset. So as, as it relates to the implementation of pharmacogenetics into clinical practice in the current setting, most of this relates to um, genes that encode drug metabolizing enzymes. And so I want to just do a quick um, sort of pharmacokinetic overview, if you will. So we have really two kinds of drugs. Drugs that, as consumed, are the active moiety. So I'm sort of showing the active moiety is this like excited thing, because it's active. Um, and um, or prodrugs. So prodrugs are, are compounds that um, the chemical structure is such that it has to be bioactivated in the body into the active form. Um, and that always occurs by metabolism. So, so most drugs we use are active drugs and they are then inactivated in the liver um, to more soluble um, drugs that are easier to eliminate typically in the, in the kidneys. Um, or, as I said, prodrugs that have to be bioactivated, and then these active compounds, again, in many cases, are further metabolized so that they can be easily uh, excreted in the kidneys. So the reality is that for a number of the most important drug metabolizing enzymes in the liver, there's important genetic variation, and that can lead to increases in metabolism, decreases in metabolism, or really the absence of metabolism because there's no functional protein present. So we'll talk about a few of those. So if you have an active drug and you have a scenario where the genetic variation has caused the absence of a functional protein, you're going to have very high drug concentrations because you're not able to break it down, and that's going to increase your risk of toxicity. On the other hand, if you have that same scenario for a prodrug, you're not going to be able to activate that drug. So you're going to have very low active drug concentrations, and so you'll have a reduction or an absence of efficacy. If we talk about a scenario where we have increased drug metabolism, um, so the, the liver is, if you will, working faster, then you're going to have less active drug um, in the case of the active drug that needs inactivated. So it's going to be inactivated very rapidly. So you'll have reduced effectiveness at a normal dose. And then just the opposite, again, for a prodrug, you have more of it activated um, into that active form. And so you can have an increased risk of toxicity with a normal dose. All right, so JJ is a 57-year-old female with chronic back pain who presents to clinic stating nothing's helping my pain. Um, she's got a past medical history of a herniated disc and a laminectomy and degenerative disc disease. She's taking tramadol, 100 milligrams every four to six hours as needed for pain. And it turns out that she's a CYP2D6 poor, um, star 4, star 4 genotype, which means she's a poor metabolizer. So the question is, um, is this appropriate? So JJ happens to be my initials. I happen to be a star four, star four. The stuff in the middle is not true. Um, I don't take trim at all. Um, but I use this as an illustrative example. And I tell you my genotype just to sort of say these are not like one in a million kind of things. <clears throat> so, um, so what's the story with tramadol? Tramadol is an example of a prodrug 
Tramadol is also a drug that's prescribed about, 50 million, about 75 million times a year in the United States. Um, so it turns out there's only one enzyme that can activate tramadol to its active form, which is O-desmethyltramadol. And that enzyme is CYP2D6, which has genetic variation that can lead to the loss of a functional protein. Um, so in the example of a poor metabolizer, which this patient is, that's 5 to 10 percent um, of the population, uh, the, the, these individuals have no functional alleles or two no function alleles, two non-functional alleles. Um, and so tramadol cannot possibly work for this person. It cannot work. They cannot activate it into its um, pharmacologically active form. And so, you know, this is where I think um, there are some opportunities as it relates to, um, for example, concerns about um, opioid abuse, opioid addiction, um, you're going to have a percent of the patient population that's coming to you saying this drug isn't working and the natural tendency is to think that that person is drug seeking. And in reality, they may be telling you the absolute truth, which is the drug isn't working because the drug cannot possibly work. For intermediate metabolizers, this is another um, 5 to 10 percent of the population. They have very reduced um, activity for the CYP2D6 um, gene, and so they will have maybe a little bit of response, but again, they're not likely um, to respond to tramadol. Normal metabolizers is 80 to 90 percent of the population. These are sort of how we've gotten our average population doses because they're the most common in the population. Tramadol is completely fine for them. That's how it got approved, is because most of the people in trials would have been normal metabolizers. However, there are a lot of commonly used drugs, um, and these are some examples that basically so potently inhibit the CYP2D6 enzyme that they turn them into a poor metabolizer. So just like me, star four, star four, poor metabolizer genotype, a normal metabolizer on one of these drugs also cannot bioactivate tramadol, cannot obtain any benefit from tramadol. Um, so the FDA has a list of um, drugs that they consider strong inhibitors. The strong inhibitors are ones that we consider to basically wipe out the protein's function um, while that other drug is present, present, and then they have moderate inhibitors. And then finally, CYP2D6 is a very interesting gene because it also undergoes um, gene duplication and multiplication. So some people will have more than two alleles. Remember, you usually get one copy um, from mom and dad. So this gene, for whatever reason, um, in uh, one or two percent of the population, which is sort of low, but not super, right? That's, that's still considered um, not rare. Um, rare in genetics is less than one percent. Um, have gene duplication, which means that they have um, uh, multiple copies of the CYP2D6 gene, more than two, um, and so they have more than two fully functional copies, which means their CYP2D6 enzyme activity is very high, and so a normal dose of tramadol in this patient could cause toxicities. Um, and in fact, there are there you may know that there are now. Um, there are now boxed warnings on tramadol and codeine for children. And the reason for that is this. So um, individuals who are ultra metabolizers, and there are several cases in the literature of children who died, a breastfed infant who died um, because they were ultra rapid metabolizers and generated very high levels of the active metabolite um, and died of respiratory depression. So this exact same story is true for codeine. Codeine is inactive, has to be bioactivated into morphine. Again, the box warning on codeine is for exactly this reason. Hydrocodone and oxycodone, similar stories. Um, they do have some analgesic activity as the parent drug, but they, their, their metabolites are much more active. So it's not quite as clear cut um, with hydrocodone and oxycodone. Um, we have some similar issues um, around antidepressants commonly used antidepressants. Um, and these involve um, two genes, CYP2D6, which I just talked to you about, and CYP2C19, another common drug metabolizing enzyme. So um, these, are the, these are the SSRIs and the tricyclics that are affected by one or both of these genes. And um, 
And, and so the tricyclics are sort of an asterisk because um, this is probably most problematic if you're using it at antidepressant doses, which is not done very often um, nowadays. So, so clinically, the tricyclics um, may be a little less important because we don't tend to use them at the doses where you would be concerned about this. Um, these are all examples of drugs that we give in the active form, and so they are inactivated um, by one, by mul typically multiple drug metabolizing enzymes. But again, if these enzymes have genetic variation, then it could influence um, what's happening. So again, just to run through this, um, if you have a poor metabolizer, now in this case, they're not able to inactivate, so they're gonna have very high drug concentrations. Um, again, this is five to 10% of the population as it relates to CYP2D6, um, and a, a similar, slightly lower percent for CYP2C19. So these are people who, for either gene, um, don't have a functional protein. Uh, intermediate metabolizers are those who have a reduced um, function because typically they have one of, one of their two alleles is not functional. Um, so they're gonna have increased drug concentrations and an increased risk of toxicity. This is 30 to 50% of the population for CYP2C19. Um, two to 11% of the population um, for CYP2D6. And you would say, why is that? Because the above percentages are similar. Um, and it has to do with how we define intermediate metabolizer for these two genes. And then both of them have this increased metabolism. In the case of CYP2C19, it's because there's um, sort of enhancer in the gene, um, an enhancer SNP that causes more protein to be expressed. Um, and again, if they have high levels or high levels of the protein, so high activity of the protein, then it's going to, a normal dose is not going to lead, lead to normal drug concentrations. Um, and so a normal dose is probably not going to be effective uh, in these individuals. Again, that's 30 to 35 percent of the population as it relates to CYP2C19. To, to which means that only about 30 to 40% of the population has normal CYP2C19. So they're either sort of at this poor function end or this high function end, um, which makes that one a particularly important gene. So um, there's an international consortium that helps to evaluate the literature and develop guidelines in pharmacogenetics. Um, it's called CPIC, or Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium. And um, there are hundreds of members from hundreds of institutions um, and dozens of countries that participate in these. There are over 50 um, drugs that are included in these guidelines, and these only focus on inherited genetic variation, so what we call germline variation, so the variation you get from your mom and dad. Um, they, at this point, have not focused on somatic variation, which is tumor, genetic variation in a tumor, but there are lots and lots of um, examples. But the cancer, the cancer guidelines tend to do a good job sort of talking about that, so CPIC, um, has focused on uh, germline um, variation, which means the variation uh, that is constant across your life and that you get from mom and dad. Um, so this is the CPIC website. There's also a really useful um, uh, knowledge base called PharmGKB that just is, is packed full of really sort of very basic um, to very clinical information about pharmacogenetics. So what I did is go through the CPIC guidelines. There are 23 guidelines plus another three in progress. And um, they cover 19 genes and, as I said, over 50 drugs. These are the ones that either in family medicine you would be commonly prescribing um, or you would probably somewhat commonly see in your patient population. So you can see that the heavy hitters really are CYP2D6 and CYP2C19. Um, so you have the analgesics I talked about, tricyclics, um, tamoxifen, uh, SSRIs, on Dancitron, which it turns out in many health systems is the most commonly used of all of these drugs, which is sort of interesting, um, and atomoxetine, which is for um, ADHD. Uh, CYP2C19, again, tricyclics, clopidogrel, voriconazole, um, SSRIs, PPP, PPIs. So within those groups, there's lots of drugs, and I think you can tell these are, these are drugs that are prescribed pretty commonly in primary care. Um, Warfarin, there are three genes that we can use to guide uh, its therapy, um, and so you can just sort of glance over uh, these other examples of these other drugs. At UF, we have looked at what is the frequency of prescription of CPIC drugs? Because one of our questions is we can do a genetic test for one gene, or we can do a genetic test for a bunch of genes, and the reality is it costs about the same thing. 
Um, and unfortunately, the payers don't sort of recognize that. So they may reject, if I do CYP2C19 and seven other genes, they may reject that claim. But if I do CYP2C19 and charge them $300 and do CYP2D6 and charge them $450, which is about what um, Medicare pays for those, they'll pay those. This is like completely illogical. This is what's broken about our healthcare system. Um, but, um, but, but we continue to really believe that panels, and eventually we think that genetic information will be widely available um, on patients at some point. And so what we did is we looked at every patient at UF Health um, Shands Hospital, which is in Gainesville, our, our base hospital, and UF Health Jacksonville. And we said any patient who had a prescription for uh, tramadol, hydrocodone, and code, or codeine, which is the drugs that we're going to focus on um, in the IGNITE trial, how often in the following year did they get one of the other drugs that has a CPIC, one of the other non-cancer drugs, and I didn't show you the cancer drugs, one of the other non-cancer drugs, um, and so 65% in one year got at least one other drug that we could do guidance on. And so this is, um, these are sort of the counts, um, so, and these are only in patients who got an opioid. So this isn't our, so you can imagine in patients who got an opioid, 10 to 12,000 also got a PPI. Um, and you can see 4 to 6,000 also got an antidepressant, um, et cetera. So I mean, I think it's fair to say that you prescribe um, probably all of these drugs, except maybe uh, clopidogrel, on a fairly regular basis. And so we think there are lots of opportunities, particularly in primary care, particularly in chronic disease management. Um, the other thing, we have a, a training grant in genomic medicine, and one of our uh, postdocs is focused on whether underserved, rural, rural, in our case, mostly rural underserved patients, I think it would be similar, um, actually may benefit more from pharmacogenetics than sort of well-served. Um, and she basically has shown that um, patients who are underserved are more likely to be on these drugs than patients who are well served um, by the healthcare system. And not surprising to you, I'm sure, they also make less visits to the doctor, which means it's more important to get it right from the beginning. So we're really trying to build the case that this is actually probably of greater benefit to the underserved population um, than it is to the well served population uh, in our country. Okay, what I want to do now is talk a little bit about some of our data that we have been working on um, to document, okay, you can do this, there's some interesting evidence, can you really change outcomes for patients? Um, and so uh, the one that I'll tell you about is very similar to one of the three trials that we're going to be doing in IGNITE. Basically, this is sort of the IGNITE version is a scaled up version of what we have already done. So this was a pragmatic trial of CYP2D6 guided opioid prescribing. So we took patients who had chronic pain um, from our primary care clinics at UF, uh, and we also um, enrolled a private uh, patients from a private practice a primary care site in Orlando. So greater than three months of pain, um, which a lot of people would say is a really sort of tough nut to crack. Um, we randomized patients two to one, or we randomized clinics, which we're not gonna do again because that has some challenges. Um, and so we had four clinics that were enrolling implementation patients and three clinics enrolling um, control patients. Again, we are gonna randomize at the patient level and ignite. And so we collected patient-reported outcomes on pain and a bunch of other things and collected a DNA sample, genotype for the CYP2D6, and then provided a recommendation <clears throat> for the patient um, based on a consult note because we are taking into account not just genotype but drug interactions, and the drug interactions are very common in this population. So if you paid attention, the, a lot of the interacting drugs are antidepressants, and so a lot of these chronic pain patients are also on antidepressants. We did three-month follow-up and then looked at patient-reported outcomes again. We genotyped the control group patients if they wanted. 96% of the patients wanted their genotype reported um, into the medical record. Um, and so this is, this is what we did. So we had the CYP2D6 genotype and the inhibitors. Again, these are the drugs that we took into consideration to come up with the CYP2D6 phenotype. Ultra metabolizers, we said, avoid. All of those drugs, codeine, tramadol, hydrocodone, and oxycodone. Uh, normal metabolizers, we didn't make any recommendations. Um, intermediate metabolizers, we were recommending against um, use of these four drugs, although not quite as strongly as we were recommending against the use of those four drugs in poor metabolizers. These are also the CPIC 
guidelines for um, these drugs. So these are our data. So this is a composite of pain intensity, um, and it's a composite of the average pain over the last seven days, the pain now, and the worst pain in the last seven days. So we took a composite um, of those. And so just to orient you, our hypothesis would be in normal metabolizers, we're not going to change outcomes because they're fine. We're not making any recommendations. And so in the genotype guided versus usual care, that's what we saw. They had a little bit of improvement in pain, no difference. That's exactly what we expected. Um, where we expect differences in those who can't activate the drug and really can't benefit, so our intermediate and poor metabolizers. And indeed, we saw significant differences um, in the pain improvement. Um, these are patients who had to have three months of pain that had an average of one year of chronic pain um, and average pain scores of 6.7. Um, so a lot of people would say, you can't do anything about that. You can't really improve their pain. Um, and so, but we did see significant improvements um, in the pain group. Now, when we first presented these data, some people said, well, yeah, you probably stepped it up to morphine or something like that. And that's actually not what happened. In most cases, they were actually just pulled off um, and given an NSAID. And I think it gave both the physician and the patient reassurance that that drug wasn't working. Um, so it's sort of, there's some interesting psychology at play there. And we, so we were really not seeing a step up in the use of the opioid um, through these recommendations. So, so really sort of interesting. So this was published earlier this year. I want to tell you about a drug that, or a setting that is not sort of relevant to you, but I think it's important to sort of show um, how this evidence building and some of the things we're doing in um, and IGNITE are important. Um, and so this is um, in the setting of acute coronary syndrome and patients undergoing percutaneous coronary intervention. Clopidogrel is an example of a prodrug, so it has to be bioactivated. It's bioactivated by CYP2C19. Um, again, 30 to 35% of the population who are of European or African ancestry are not gonna be able to do that well. Or, um, and then patients of Asian ancestry, it's in the 50 to 70% range, are intermediate or poor metabolizers. Uh, again, these are the CPIC guidelines. Um, these are actually first authored by Stuart Scott, who is well known to all of you, I'm sure. Um, leads the pathology genetics group here. Um, so this also, ha as we talked about, has this increased metabolism um, phenotype, which doesn't seem to matter for clopidogrel, so there are no recommended changes there. Normal metabolizers recommended to get <clears throat> clopidogrel. But those who carry one of these um, genetic variations that leads to uh, reducing the, and the function of the protein and reduced metabolism are recommended to get alternative ther therapy, prasigrel or ticagrelor, so IMs or PMs. <clears throat> So um, we had first started, this was our first implementation in 2012. We then watched those patients for about a year and a half to two years, and we were seeing differences in outcomes. Um, and so then as part of a collaborative effort within IGNITE, um, we collected uh, individuals or, or institutions uh, that had done similar to us, had implemented pharmacogenetic testing, um, and made these similar recommendations. And so what you see here, um, again, in this cohort of nearly uh, 2,000 individuals, about 30% um, have a loss of function allele. Um, and of those, the recommendation was followed 60% of the time. So 40% of the patients still got clopidogrel, even though we were saying, eh, the genetics said that might not work so well. Um, in contrast, in those who don't ha have a loss of function allele, um, clopidogrel was used 85% of the time. Uh, and so clearly what this shows is we were changing um, prescribing practices to some degree among the interventional cardiologists. <clears throat> These are the outcomes data. So this is major adverse cardiovascular death events, death, stroke, and myocardial infarction. Um, and so those individuals who had a loss of function allele and continued on clopidogrel against, this was something we recommended against. They had worse outcomes than those individuals who got the alternative therapy because of their loss of function allele. So that was statistically significant. Um, this wasn't a randomized trial. If anybody knows cardiologists, they don't like anything that's not a randomized controlled trial. Um, but we did the best we could and um, to, to, to make adjustments for potential differences. So we did propensity scoring um, and the hazard ratio um, was a little over two. So if you have a loss of function allele, 
and you get clopidogrel, you're two times more likely to have a major cardiovascular event than if you have a loss of functional allele and get alternative therapy. Um, personally, I'm not going to take this drug without knowing my CYP2C19 genotype. Um, cardiologists, this has not generally been enough to convince them. Um, but then a few weeks ago, a study was published. We'll see if this changes their mind. So this is called popular genetics. Um, so this is a much larger trial um, with nearly 3,000 individuals. Um, and this is a little bit hard to see. They were randomized to genotype-guided or standard treatment. Um, and genotype-guided was um, in cyp 2 19 intermediate or poor metabolizers, they got standard treatment, which they defined as ticagrelor or prasugrel. But if they, had an, if they were normal metabolizers, so they had no loss of function alleles, then they were to get clopidogrel. And so again, very similar to our numbers, 39% were IM or PM, 61% um, got clopidogrel. <clears throat> Standard treatment, again, was um, ticagrelor or prasugrel. In this trial, 91% got ticagrelor, um, which you probably know is much more expensive, um, has probably increased risk of bleeding, and also a really bothersome cough that a lot of patients don't like. So they had two uh, co-primary outcomes. One was adverse clinical events, which was a composite of death, MI, stent thrombosis, stroke, and major bleeding. And this was a non-inferiority hypothesis hypothesis, and then they also had a major bleeding primary endpoint, and that was a superiority hypothesis. So um, basically, that genotype guided would be superior in terms of bleeding and non-inferior in terms of major adverse cardiovascular events. So these are the outcome data. Um, so the primary outcome, so that composite, that big composite, um, was highly significant for their non-inferiority, so it met the non-inferiority um, this is sort of a blow up. So you can see that although from a superiority perspective, it did not achieve statistical significance, the genotype guided group numerically did do better. Um, then, uh, so this is clopidogrel in patients who are normal metabolizers and um, the, one of the other drugs in everybody else. Um, this is the bleeding endpoint, um, and it did meet the superiority um, uh, hypothesis, and so, uh, there's a 22% lower risk of bleeding in the genotype-guided group than in the standard treatment group. Um, and so what, so what does this say? One is it says that a genotype-guided approach um, can allow you to optimize therapy, and in this scenario, allow you to pre prescribe um, a drug to a patient. In many cases, it is less expensive, um, tends to have less sort of troublesome side effects that affect um, adherence to therapy, uh, and less bleeding. So that seems like a win, right? You clearly don't want to give clopidogrel um, to patients who are IMs or PMs, but everybody else, it's probably actually a pretty good choice. So, you know, one of my points is that the Ignite Network really laid sort of the foundation documenting that you can see differences in outcomes, um, and then this randomized controlled trial really just extended that and showed not only is it a bad idea to give clopidogrel in IMs and PMs, but that um, in NMs, it's actually, from, a, from an efficacy standpoint, it's, it's equal to the other drugs and from a safety standpoint, um, superior. So um, let me talk now a little bit about what we have done at UF Health. I'm gonna grab my tea. Um, so as I mentioned, we began our implementations in 2012. We started with clopidogrel in the cardiac cath lab. Um, and then we were funded in Ignite in 2013. Since then, we did implementations for TPMT and the thiopurines. Um, these are actually highly used when you look at the thiopurines across disease states, so pediatric ALL, um, uh, inflammatory bowel diseases, um, Dermat and dermatology, rheumatology. So these actually are more commonly used drugs than I think we tend to think. Um, this uh, is a PEG interferon. Uh, I, so I think we implemented on um, July 1st and something like 
August 1st, the new hep C drugs were approved. <laughs> so this one didn't go that well because they don't really use these drugs anymore, but that's fine. Um, CYP2D6 opioids in our primary care setting, we started in 2015. We then implemented in our Jacksonville hospital with CYP2C19 clopidogrel, um, but we used a point of care test that was basically based in the cath lab, rapid turnaround genotype available before the patient left the cath lab, which, which is really great. Um, in our pediatric site clinic, we implemented uh, CYP2D6, CYP2C19 guided SSRI therapy. Uh, in 2017, we implemented uh, in our adult GI clinic for guiding PPIs and in collaboration with the Moore's Children's Hospital. Um, also did that in a pediatric setting. Um, and then um, we started... Um, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, a trial in our arthroplastic surgery patient population uh, implementing a genotype guided approach. So I think if you look at the literature around opioid persistence, um, there's a lot of new opioid addiction that occurs because of post-surgical prescription of opioids. So surgeons, I think, are really, really concerned about this. <clears throat> and, and this is also a great setting to implement because the, the issue of getting the genotype in front of the physician is really, really easy in this setting. So we've got over 90% adoption of the genotype um, guided recommendation. So we've got some really interesting outcomes from this trial that I'm not going to tell you about because um, they're not published yet, but we'll just say that they're very promising. Um, and then we um, recently implemented our panel, and we're now doing an, on an oncology supportive care trial um, where we're really saying, okay, so a patient is diagnosed... Um, or particularly with solid tumor, what's the likelihood that they're not over the course of the next few years going to get a pain med, an antidepressant, uh, an anti-nausea drug, a PPI, like the likelihood that you're not going to get one of those drugs as a prescription as a newly diagnosed cancer patient is almost zero. And so we're looking at whether, um, again, in a pragmatic trial design, we can have better um, outcomes for those patients, not in terms of their survival, clearly, but in terms of sort of the quality of life um, uh, indices that those drugs are tending to try to address. So what have we learned in our seven years of implementation? Um, and so we actually published a paper recently um, led by one of our junior faculty members, Emily Sakali, and we really looked at it in terms of um, prescribers and patients, and, and we had really our prescriber base um, sort of help define this. So one of the things that we found in terms of effective educational approaches, um, <clears throat> so somebody should talk to Stuart and think about this, um, is that personal genotyping with case studies is really helpful. So I told you my genotype as we walk through this case, but if we gave you all of your genotypes, um, we have found that that helps engage in understanding the content and understand in the learning. Um, we've also found that going back into the clinical setting with case studies um, that have evolved during the process um, was really helpful. So we educate at the front end, but then once we have a really nice sort of illustrative case, we go back and um, you know do noon conference or whatever it is, sort of a, a more casual um, setting, um, but that that can be really, really effective in helping, especially, so a lot of times there's like a champion, and then there's the people that are like, watching, right? They're sort of watching to see what's going to happen. And I think those case studies really help those, you know, sort of watching carefully. People say, yeah, maybe this is a good idea to adopt. Um, we also found, so we tried some online education approaches and those did not work. So it seems like uh, in-person education is key. In terms of using the genetic information in practice, um, Generally, I think it's, it's clear to us that, at least at this point in time, physicians or prescribers aren't going to interrupt their workflow for this, especially um, in a new program. And so figuring out how to make it work in a way that's not highly disruptive to the workflow um, is really important for people who are building an implementation. Um, and, and optimally, the genotype results need to be in front of the physician at the same time that the patient is front of the physician. Now that sort of makes sense, um, and it really ties to that workflow thing. And that's frankly why in the um, arthroplastic surgery setting it has worked beautifully, because we take their genotype when they have the visit where the there's a decision to have surgery, right? Then they have to have a pre-op visit within one month of the surgery, 
And that's typically where the surgeons write a prescription for the opioid. So the genotype's already there. It's in front of them. They know what to do. Um, and so that's really been easy. Um, and so that's not so easy in primary care. We haven't, we haven't completely solved that. Um, although we think a panel uh, for the first drug, the panel won't solve that. Um, but for every other drug after that, it will be there and it would be in front of the um, prescriber. <clears throat> So it's also clear that um, the typical practitioner is not going to sort of get in the weeds. They're not going to read the CPIC guidelines. We have clinical decision support alerts that link out to you know, the evidence, the, the, the guideline evidence, the actual primary literature evidence. Nobody ever clicks on them. right? And that's not surprising. But I think the point is that um, we need to provide the prescribers information on what to do with that information. If you don't tell them what to do, it's probably not going to be helpful. Um, we, also, uh, we also know that um, it can't just be in the result from the pathology lab. Um, so I think you guys are on EPIC. We're on EPIC. It sounds like every EHR system lab results get buried very, very quickly. So, um, and these are lifetime results. And so there has to be sort of clinical decision support built that says drug plus this genotype, it's going to fire an alert and tell the prescriber what to do. Um, we think it would be helpful, and we are having a lot of conversations, and Epic at least says that they're thinking about this, but they've been saying that for years, so who knows what that means. Um, but having a lifetime results section of the EHR um, would be really helpful, because then these results would not get so buried um, and could be really helpful. Finally, you know, some people are like, oh, well, this information is non-informative in a normal metabolizer. Right, because you're not going to change anything. In fact, that is not how patients feel about it, and that's not how prescribers have felt about it. Because in both scenarios, they're like, okay, that tells me something. It tells me that if I'm having trouble getting this patient's pain controlled or this patient's depression controlled, it's not this. Right? I need to think about something else, but it's not this. Um, and so we, we have, uh, frankly, been a little bit surprised that people felt as, pod, as positively about what normal metabolism means. For patients, it's easy for them to understand these concepts. They know individuals who don't respond to certain drugs or have had a side effect from a drug. They probably have had a drug that didn't work or had a side effect. So the concept for them is, is really quite easy. Um, and they're really enthusiastic to have their data, their pharmacogenetics data in the medical record. We've done a number of trials where we offered genotyping in the control arm after the trial was done, and our uptake on that is over 95%. So, and in fact, physicians have told us, I won't participate in this trial if my control arm patients can't have their genotype result. So um, there's really, truly a lot of interest in that. People ask about, you know, um, are they willing to do a blood sample collection? A non-invasive collection method for children is really important. Um, adults don't seem to care. So if it's easy to get a blood sample, get a blood sample because the quality of the DNA is better, frankly. Um, but in, in Ignite um, and in many clinical practice settings, there are also non-invasive methods, buccal swab um, or a saliva sample. We also found that if you're doing research studies and you're doing patient reported outcome surveys, the length of the survey isn't as big a deal as how often you ask. Um, and so, uh, so as we've developed Ignite, we've tried to be really sensitive to that. OK, let me tell you quickly about Ignite. Uh, the IGNITE trial, which is called ADOPT, and ADOPT stands for A Depression and Opioid Pragmatic Trial of Pharmacogenetics, or ADOPT PGX. Isn't that clever? Uh, <laughs> um, so the aims of the study are basically to determine whether genotype-guided opioids or SSRI lead to improved pain control or depression symptoms. So there will be three arms to the trial, or essentially three standalone trials, all under this ADOPT umbrella. There will be an acute pain trial. So this will be um, a trial looking at post-surgical pain. I'm not really going to tell you any more about that, because it's not going to affect you. Um, a chronic pain trial, very similar to the one I just described to you, uh, and a depression trial. Um, and so we have primary out primary outcomes that are really focused on the symptom that we're enrolling for. Um, and then we'll have secondary outcomes um, that look at the effect of these on um, overall well-being as well as healthcare utilization.
This is kind of a busy slide, um, but I'll try to walk you through it. Again, I'm not gonna talk to you about the acute pain trial, so we'll just focus on chronic pain and depression. Basically, patients will be um, consent and will be um, uh, approached, consented, randomized either to the control arm, which is a delayed pharmacogenetic testing arm, or the intervention arm. So that's true for both trials. Um, there'll be a visit where this DNA collection happens, and, um, and then the clock basically starts when the genotype result is returned. Uh, in the um, control arm patients, that will be seven days after their sample is collected because there's an assumption that it'll be about seven days to return the result. So the result will, um, and, and different labs are gonna handle this uh, differently, but the result will not be returned into the EHR um, for the control arm patients until after they have completed the trial, which is six month follow up. And at that point, um, then it will be reported and clinical decision supports uh, can fire. In the intervention arm, again, these are really identical. Um, in the intervention arm, pharmacogenetic testing, if they have an actionable phenotype, um, then that will lead to a recommendation to do something differently or will guide the recommendation. We're doing patient reported outcome at baseline, one month, three months, and six months. In both of these trials, the three month time point is the primary outcome endpoint. That's really important as you implement this trial in your setting because um, the team and the prescribers have to sort of figure out a way. If, if you see a patient here, DNA is collected, and you, you say, we're gonna wait until we see them again before we do anything with that genetic information. If it so happens that their next appointment is in 3.2 months, or even if it's in 2.8 months, there's not gonna be any time for the genetic information to improve their outcomes because it won't have been acted on. So I think that's one of the things that the team is really working hard to figure out is how to get this information in front um, of the clinician and really get in action at the time that the, the result is returned. Um, in our psych study, and this was in pediatric psych, they actually withheld um, writing the prescription till the genotype result was back. Um, and we had a lot of discussions about that um, as a trial, and the decision was we couldn't make that, we couldn't sort of impose that in the trial, but that's certainly something that can be considered. Do you just wanna wait for a week before we decide what we're going to do, as opposed to prescribe something new and then maybe call them up in a week and say, let's not do that after all. So I think um, you know, those are sort of local decisions that can be made. Um, in terms of the res return of the results, um, if they're in the intervention arm, it will go into the EHR immediately. There will be cl clinical decision support built. Um, what we've presented to the DSMB, which met last week or two weeks ago, um, is that there will be a static report that lives in the EHR um, that has the result interpretation, takes into account drug-drug interactions with some at least treatment avoidance or treatment recommendations. Um, and then also uh, optional sort of site, to, site specific to decide um, sort of pop-up alerts. And, and we would encourage these, but I think we're as a trial saying that doesn't have to happen. In the control arm, um, basically nothing will happen until they do their six month follow-up and then uh, their results will be returned. We will also at the completion of the trial participation, uh, we will mail results uh, to the patients, because of some recent FDA, um, they're more than guidances, I would say, um, we probably won't have any drugs, so we'll just say CYP2D6, intermediate metabolizer, you may have reduced metabolism of drugs that use this um, enzyme, uh, because the FDA has gotten very funny, fussy, I would say, um, recently, just frankly, because there are some people doing ridiculous stuff out there. Um, and so they basically said they don't want patients getting information about the drugs because they're afraid that patients are going to say, you know, I'm a CYP2D6 poor metabolizer and it says, you know, this doesn't, this is, this drug is a problem and then the patient will stop that drug. Um, so these are going to be the recommendations um, for tramadol coding and hydrocodone. Well, for all four drugs, we'll recommend avoiding in ultra metabolizers because of the high toxicity risk. 
in normal metabolizers. We're really trying to push tramadol as the preferred opioid because um, there's a fair amount of evidence of reduced risk of opioid persistence, opioid addiction um, with tramadol. <clears throat> than with these other uh, agents. For intermediate metabolizers, we'll recommend avoid um, in these three drugs. In our trial, we did not see a genotype link with oxycodone. So it's not as clear that CYP2D6 um, uh, intermediate and poor metabolism status affects pain control for oxycodone. So we're saying oxycodone in these patients is fine. Um, and then same thing for poor metabolizers. We're recommending to avoid tramadol codeine and hydrocodone. Um, the S these are the SSRI recommendations. Um, so for, uh, paroxetine and fluvoxamine um, will have CYP2D6 driven recommendations. Uh, citalopram, escitalopram, and sertraline um, will have CYP2C19 guided recommendations. Um, and you can see it's sort of a mishmash. And this is the reason we can't sort of expect clinicians to know this or even necessarily to look it up. So providing that information in a really interpretable way uh, is important. So in terms of the trial, um, what are we collecting? We'll have demographic data. We'll collect um, pain assessments, which will include intensity, um, pain intensity, opioid use disorder, mobility data, um, and in our acute pain study, um, daily opioid use, because we really have a question about whether we can reduce the, um, the actual exposure to opioids. For depression, um, we'll be doing, using depression instruments, and this will be both in the chronic pain and the depression trials. Um, we'll be collecting a lot of information about medications, um, quality of life and well-being, again, mostly through patient-reported outcome surveys. And then in individuals who are on our plane right now as individuals on Medicare and Medicaid, um, we will get claims data, and so we'll use those primarily um, for health care utilization, so sort of our economic analyses. In terms of data collection, these are the endpoints, the time points, and the way we've set it up is the local study coordinators will collect at baseline, and then we'll have a call center based at the University of Florida that will do all of the follow-up. So they'll either call the patients on the phone and walk them through the surveys, or they will um, send them to them electronically via text or email, and they can fill them out online. So um, from an from a implementation of the trial perspective, we think that that's really um, going to help. Our primary endpoints um, for the uh, chronic pain study, the primary endpoint is the change in the composite pain intensity from uh, baseline to three months. And secondary endpoints include sort of the magnitude of that reduction, um, so the percent, um, percent reduction, the portion achieving a 30% reduction in pain. That's the FDA definition um, that a new drug must meet. They must show a 30% reduction in pain. Um, so we want to see if we can hit that, which is sort of this clinically significant pain reduction. Um, and then also pain prescription um, misuse, so the opioid, to try to get at the opioid um, use disorder questions. Uh, for depression, pretty similar change in depression score from baseline to three months. Secondary endpoints will be side effects, which we think will be important because a lot of these do, um, it's really a risk of a hydro concentration. <clears throat> um, medication adherence, which again can be driven by side effects and, um, and remission at six months. This is um, sort of the core part of our team at UF, and so I want to acknowledge them because it takes, a, it takes an army or a village, however you want to say it, um, to do this work. And then also um, the Adopt Pharmacogenetics team. So in, um, in the IGNITE trial, three of the five sites that got funded had proposed pharmacogenetics trials. And so we worked together to sort of put together um, what we had each proposed to come up with these. Um, so acknowledgments, um, not just to the UF team, um, but to the Indiana University and Vanderbilt team um, and we have been working like crazy for about a year to, to plan this trial. So with that, I'll say thank you and see if there's any questions. So what's ready for prime time in terms of things that you think should be um, part of primary care? Now, should we be testing all of our patients? I mean, at some point in everybody's life, they're going to get one or more of these drugs. Well, I mean, I think, yeah. So the que so everybody heard that question. I don't have to repeat it, right? Yeah. yeah so... Um, so this is one of the conversations we're having. We think exactly what you're saying. In the primary, in the primary care setting, um, 
most people in their, I mean, most humans in their life are going to be exposed to many of those drugs. Um, and so the question is, can you just do a genetic test at some point in somebody's life? I don't know, when they're 40, because that's when they start getting chronic diseases. Or, um, but the reality is right now, nobody will pay for that. Now, maybe in a value-based care system, it makes sense, right? But in our sort of reimbursement model right now, um, our fee-for-service model, it, that won't get paid for by an insurance company. So then the question is, can you have a trigger drug, right? So you have a prescription for an opioid and you want to do the test, but you do the whole panel, and then for the rest of their life, you have it for everything else. And I think, you know, being sort of practically based, I think that's sort of where we are right now, but we really do think that truly preemptive in some ways makes a lot of sense because then you overcome that barrier of not having it in front of the clinician when they're needing to make a decision. Um, so, so, you know, and, and we're, we're working with our health system to do um, and try to figure out, can we build a model where we just do truly a preemptive um, or do we do this sort of trigger drug panel approach? So we're building a health plan for our employees that's going to come into play January 1st. And the thing that was in my mind through this whole talk is, does it make sense to suggest that all of our employees get this test? Because down the road, there could be tremendous savings in getting people's right. um, chronic conditions um, in control much more quickly. So that's, that's what, do we know anything about the cost outcome in relationship to the cost of the test and how much does it cost to do? Yeah, so um, so so at risk of making Stuart angry, well, I'll, I'll just say that you can test for all those genes for somewhere between $250 and $500. Um, and so, so I'm not sure what the billing thing is. I have an idea what he's paying, what he's being paid in the trial to do that. Um, and uh, so, so do I have evidence that documents the value of that panel-based test? No, and that's why we're going to be rec making recommendations on multiple. Our goal is to make recommendations across multiple drugs. Um, and that's why in the economic analysis, we sort of want to look at that. But in, at UF, we're talking about exactly the same thing because we have an employee-based healthcare system. Um, and so we feel like that's the starting place. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, even PPIs, which are, you know, really sort of symptom control drugs, I mean, they, you know, they, you can probably reduce visits um, you can reduce in many cases, because a lot of patients are underdosed, because 30% of the population is going to need a higher than normal dose. Um, you may prevent procedures. Uh, my husband actually has done a lot of work in this space, and in children, um, showed that um, pediatric, so children were getting fundoplication and the ultra-metabolizer phenotype was overrepresented, which implies that all they needed was a higher dose, right? You think about that, that's awful. Like you took a kid to surgery and they just needed a higher dose of the drug. So, I mean, you know, some people would say PPIs are sort of the least important on that list. And yet I think there, even for those drugs, there are lots of ways that you could think of how they might um, create savings in the healthcare system. I'll also tell you, if you noticed, um, so I'm, I'm consulting with United Health Group because United thinks that they can improve outcomes and save money by doing this. And so they're looking very seriously at it. Um, go ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. Mm -hmm. I think this is such a helpful and important topic. And as a PharmD, I'm very excited about the future. Um, I was wondering, um, because you were talking about preemptive pharmacogenomics, I think a lot of the health systems talk more about reactionary pharmacogenomics. How do you anticipate this changing the future of healthcare um, in terms of making interventions early? Yeah, I mean, again, I think everybody agrees that we're in the midst of a transition of our healthcare system, right, from a fee-for-service to sort of an accountable um, care sort of model. And what the time frame of that shift is, is probably, you know, regional or local. 
Um, <clears throat> I think in that ACO model, it's a lot easier to argue for preemptive testing. In a fee-for-service model, it's, it's a sort of a hard sell. Um, and so I think that some of that transition is just going to come as our sort of approach to healthcare shifts. Um, I think it's hard to make a preemptive argument for the reasons that I just said in our current healthcare environment. Um, but I do think that if you're going to do reactive testing, do reactive testing on a panel that gives it all to you, and then you basically have preemptive for everything else down the line. So I, I think that's sort of the that's the midterm solution. Uh -huh. um, thanks. Could you talk a little bit? You mentioned a little bit about the under metabolizers. Um, in the setting of tramadol, and that when those people are found, that they actually are switched more to NSAIDs rather than upgrading them to a more potent opioid. Can you talk a little bit more about how that worked? That's not what I would expect would happen. I know. Well, so, um, so I, so we think what happened, and when we talked to the primary physicians who were sort of leaders of that trial. Um, the sense we got is that it gave them the confidence to have the conversation with the patient to say. Let's just try stopping the opioid. It doesn't seem like it's been helping you anyhow. Let's just be more aggressive with the NSAID. So, I mean, I think it's something as simple as that, as, you know, it's it just, it creates this, because without that, like how many, how many patients are gonna go for that, right? And so, like, I, you're not controlling my pain and then you're gonna tell me that you're gonna take away this drug that, is known to really be helpful for pain. So I think it I think it was it, I think it was really that, right? Because they were faced with going to hydromorphone or morphine and I think in a lot of cases they're like, "Oh, geez, I don't really want to do that." Right? And so I think the physician was hesitant for that patient sitting in front of them to step them up to that. And so it just caused them to say, "Let's really give this other thing a serious try." Um, and that's honestly what we're seeing um, in our acute pain trial is that the genotype guided patients from a morphine equivalent perspective are getting less exposure to opioids. Uh-huh. Hi, Dr. Johnson. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. This is a great talk. Um, I'm Sue Mashney. I'm the chief pharmacy officer for uh, Sinai. Hi. And I, for Dr. Coleman's question, we actually are working on um, an opportunity for our employees to access uh, pharmacogenomic testing um, as part of our health benefit in 2020. So I'm so happy to hear that you're an advocate for that, and I'm going to chase you down. And start. <laughs> um, because I think that to make the case, so, you know, the carrot, I thought this was a terrific carrot for our employees that we are at risk for, that we can offer you genomic testing. You can have this preemptively if you visit with a pharmacist for a full MTM visit and a genomic counseling session, really to engage our employees with our pharmacy team, to use our MUS pharmacy to really understand the benefits that are available uh, through this pharmacogenomics testing. So really appreciate your presentation and. Uh, hope to be able to use, we're going to meet after this, but hope to be able to use a lot of what you've done at, at UF to um, make it more, um, to have an increased engagement with patients across Sinai. So really, really appreciate your talk today. Great, thank you. I'll repeat your question if you want to go ahead and... Hi, thank you for this great talk. Oh. Um, I just have a question about, um, and I know there's so much to learn in this space, but how you've sort of focused on the drugs that you have focused on, and mm -hmm. I noticed there's not a lot on, I didn't see a lot of antibiotics and like sort of other like big categories. Um, like is there sort of knowledge as to like certain sort of classes of medications having more of an impact on pharmacogenetics than yeah. others? Or? Yeah, so, so antibiotics are interesting um, for two reasons. One is that the protein target of the antibiotic is not a human protein. Um, and so from a drug target perspective, it would never really be useful. Um, and most antibiotics are not, most antibiotics are eliminated from um, the body by the kidneys. So most antibiotics don't go through a lot of um, liver metabolism. And so, um, so, that's, so that's part of that. Um, there are some really interesting data, not an antibiotic, but an um, anti-infective, really interesting data on, on voriconazole. Um, so there is a CPIC guideline for voriconazole. Um, so yeah, so the classes that are included are frankly the ones or that have been focused on are, are I would say the low hanging fruit, right? So the ones that have very extensive metabolism, 
by these major drug metabolizing enzymes and where it makes a difference clinically. So I'll give you an example of that. Um, so I've done a ton of work over the course of my career on beta blockers. Um, and metoprolol, for example, is a prototypical CYP2D6 substrate. Um, so it's 70 to 80% of metabolism uh, is uh, by CYP2D6, poor metabolizers will have four to six-fold higher drug concentrations um, than normal metabolizers. So why isn't that on the list? It's not on the list because how do we use beta blockers? We typically start at a low dose and we titrate up based on heart rate, right? So if you have patients that end up on a low dose of beta blocker and they've got a heart rate of 55, it's probably because they're a poor metabolizer, right? So as it turns out, the way we use, so those are very wide therapeutic index drugs and the way we use them the, pharmaco the pharmacogenetics doesn't sort of translate into something that, that is that important clinically just because of the way we use the drug. So these, so these are examples where the, the genes are really important um, in, in all of these cases to their pharmacokinetics. And the way we use those drugs makes, the, makes it, puts people at risk of either inefficacy or toxicity. Does that make sense? Um, now, there's lots of work going on, and we were funded for 10 years in the NIH pharmacogenomics um, network, really trying to tackle hypertension. Um, because again, I mean, frankly, hypertension control rates are dismal worldwide. Um, but it's harder because those, we're trying to get more at sort of underlying pathophysiology, and, and it's like smaller pieces for those really common complex diseases. If you're not talking about the pharmacokinetics, you know, it's like two or three or four percent, and maybe not yet predictive enough. So that so that's sort of the reason that you don't see, for example, antihypertensives in that group because they don't again tend to have important consequences for these major genes. Thanks. Um, this brought back both positive and negative memories of uh -oh. pharmacology and medical schools. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I'm well, it's good because I don't know if medical students now get this much no, pharmacology. <laughs> so I'm just wondering to raise a cautionary note about some of the ethics of this. And, and um, you know, it's not clear from this presentation that there might be ethical dilemmas, but I could see possibly if these, if these tests become widespread, what happens to this information um, given the fact that you might metabolize drugs that are more expensive, do you become, quote, a more expensive health risk for a plan? And sort of, you know, given what's going on nationally and the fact that this could be widespread, mm -hmm. what, what, what are some of the ethical dilemmas that you've encountered in, you know, how... Yeah, you so, um, you know, I would, I would, we have not seen that. Um, and, and for example, when we started, when we started our clopidogrel implementation, um, clopidogrel became generic a few months after we started, and ticagrelor came onto the market a few months after we started. And so it presented, it presented, I think, just the opposite, which is with a genotype-guided approach, you could still, with you know, a high degree of confidence, use this $4 drug rather than the $200 a month drug. Um, and so, you know, if anything, we have seen sort of the flip. Um, I, I think, you know, the other reason that in the non-cancer space, um, we don't tend to worry about this is, A, the cost of these drugs is, you know, is now like spit in the ocean um, compared to, you know, cancer drugs. My mom was just diagnosed um, with lung cancer and is going to get a targeted therapy, and it's $15,000 a month. $15,000 a month. I mean, you can't spend $15,000 on these drugs in a person's entire lifetime. So I think now, what, and, and you know, companies are improve, approving those if you have the right genetic mutation and you meet all the criteria that have been laid out in the clinical trials. So, I mean, we definitely have a drug cost issue um, in this country. And frankly, most of the new drugs being approved are targeted because there's, you know, they're very, very, very expensive, but they're not really in that common disease arena. So, so we don't have a lot of concern with that. The question I thought you might ask, 
Um, so, so the other ethical question is, because people tend to be more worried about discrimination, <clears throat> um, because of course GINA, which is the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, doesn't really prevent against, so it doesn't prevent it against discrimination for long-term care, disability, life insurance. Um, and so, so people tend to be more concerned, there tend to be a lot bigger ethical issues around disease genetic testing because of those things. None of these um, are associated with risk for disease. And so that makes them cleaner and frankly it makes it an entry point for a lot of health systems to navigate into the space without as many of those ethical concerns. The other question that came up ethically when we started our program, and we had long discussion with our medical ethicists about this and our cardiologists, so they said, well, if I do the genotype and they're a poor metabolizer and I still give them clopidogrel, am I now at risk? And the answer from the ethicist was no. They are poor metabolizers. The fact that you chose not to find that out when you can, because these tests have been available from Quest and LabCorp for years, the fact that you chose not to find that out doesn't protect you, right? So I thought that was really an interesting, right? As an interesting way to think about your lack of knowledge about this person because you haven't fully worked them up to figure out that they are a poor metabolizer, that's no protection, right? Ignorance is not, ignorance is not protection. So, so that was the other thing that, you know, we had that, there was that question early on. Um, but it hasn't come up a lot since then. Um, and when it does come up, we sort of explain that, and then people are like, oh, okay, that does sort of make sense. Thank you for this uh, very interesting talk, especially I like the one about sort of looking at the implementation science of your interventions and our lessons learned. My question is about sort of direct-to-consumer mm -hmm. genetic testing. And I haven't had it come up, but it just was dawning on me as I was sitting here, what if someone brings me their 23andMe results? And some of them talk about mm -hmm. those show more metabolized results. How reliable are those results for our clinical decision making? Yeah, so, so one of the reasons the FDA is getting super rigid is that there have been, frankly, some really inappropriate stuff happening, not only in the direct to consumer, but frankly, the through a healthcare provider, um, some really bad stuff. Like, there's no way, there's no evidence base on which we should be making these recommendations. Um, and so the FDA has sort of decided to weigh in. Um, so I think you have to figure out if they bring that in, um, so the so the F so the the um, 23andMe is done under CAP CLIA standards. So theoretically, okay, that's sort of okay. So I think that's your first question if they bring it in. Is it done under CAP CLIA standards? Number two, I will tell you that they're using the Illumina platform, um, an Illumina genome-wide platform, and Illumina, so the CYP2D6 gene is super hard. So if you talk to genome scientists, sequencing people, they say this, it's the second most complex gene in the human genome. And the first most complex is not a gene, it's the HLA region. So it's just super complicated, it's super difficult. Um, and so the reality, and I think there's some concerns with BRCA as well, is that what they have is correct, but they may not have everything. And I'll tell you for CYP2D6, it's incomplete. So what they're telling you, so for example, they can't call star four, which is the most common, so I'm star four, star four. On 23andMe, I don't know what they would call me, but they wouldn't call me star four, star four. So, so I think that's the risk. So, I mean, I think my recommendation is, A, if they look like they have something if they look like they have gen variation, I would probably confirm it in your local lab. B, if you think that it's somebody where pharmacogenetic testing would be useful because they're on drugs that are sort of at play, um, I, I probably wouldn't rely. Um, now, there are, other, <laughs> there are other places that are more reputable and do things better, but I don't know that in the, and I don't know in the direct to consumer, I, I mean, the direct to consumer space is just, 23andMe, frankly, is probably the best, 
in the direct-to-consumer place, I think the most reputable. Um, but I don't, they're not, they're not calling, as particularly for SIP 2D6, they're not calling some really important alleles. Um, so I, and then when I talked to our pathology group about this, they're like, there's this whole like chain of command thing and you know, that also makes them nervous. Like they don't really, pathology people would say, you should not put that into the medical record and sort of make that part of their record because there's this whole like, how do we really know that was their sample, right? There's this whole chain of command thing. How do we really know that's their result? So it, it's tricky. I think for now, most people would say just, if you're interested, just just get it done in a regular method through your, you know, through the pathology lab. Yeah. So uh -huh. just uh, real quickly, uh, Andrew Gusarski is here. I retired from my operations uh, running genetics as vice chair for a while ago, and now you're chief data officer. So I don't have a uh, real dog in this fight anymore. Uh, as a, member of the uh, genetics faculty, but we do have a lot of expertise in this exact question on campus. So uh, Stuart Scott was mentioned earlier, um, but uh, Nora Abelson uh, in medicine is running a new center for genomic health. Uh, I can easily provide referrals to people who can provide accurate and very actionable panel tests these days. It could be done clinically. Uh, George Diaz and colleagues in medical genetics could do that as well. Of course, Sue just mentioned our pharmacy products. So we could easily point to uh, via a number of different routes to people who could get a very valid uh, laboratory test result that would be actionable if someone were interested in doing that. The cost is not that high. So that's an option we have here. But I think people are, I mean, especially in the more well-served population, I mean, I think the estimate is by 2025, 100 million people will have had direct-to-consumer genetic testing through Ancestry, 23andMe. And so it's going to start coming to you, right? I mean, those aren't necessarily underserved patients doing that, but... I mean, I think providers are going to begin to see people carrying in their, G, you know, their GWAS results and saying, what are you going to do with this? So, Julia, you set a record for the most enthusiasm and questions ever after a grand round. So, thank you so much. <laughs> this is really thank you. It's the start of something big. We're Excellent. On the ground floor, so we're really, really excited to have you. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much.